Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ryan Dividock. I'm the supervisor for the planning, zoning, and land use unit here at Oakland County. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our virtual training series on local government law. Uh, the trainings are intended to provide a concise overview of the legal aspects of being a local elected or appointed government official. The sessions are based on chapters from the book, Local Government Law, a practical guidebook for public officials on city councils, community boards, and planning commissions. And it's authored by our presenter, Jerry Fisher. Jerry is a well-known and respected land use attorney with decades of experience working throughout Southeast Michigan. So before we get started, I just want to remind you of the today's sessions being uh, recorded. And if you have any questions, I'd like you to use the chat function in Zoom and direct your questions to Jim Schaefer. Jim will be monitoring the questions and will hold the question and answer period after the presentation. So let's get started. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jerry. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. A thousand hellos to each and every one of you. And uh, I, I really appreciate sharing lunch with you today and look forward to uh, uh, any questions you may have. And uh, so we're with, without any further ado, we can get started. Uh, this is uh, session four, local government law. And today we're going to discuss the background and importance of zoning. Uh, and uh, I try to emphasize the importance of zoning because there are a lot of people that are calling zoning into question, which opens the door for nice, good discussion. Uh, and then the second uh, part of, of the program is the non-zoning land use controls. Uh, so this is a presentation based on uh, my recent book that uh, Brian just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, and uh, uh, it's available on Amazon and all that. So if, if you think you'd like to go into a greater depth for this subject, uh, uh, that's always possible. All right, so uh, without any uh, further delay, let's get started. Uh, and we'll pick up with the first part of the session, uh, uh, namely zoning, background and importance. Now, it has been observed uh, by experts uh, that zoning is arguably the most consequential regulatory program in the United States. Now, why would that be? Presumably, that's because zoning touches so many people. I mean, if you live in uh, in any type of urban, metropolitan, or whatever area, even in some uh, less uh, less urban areas, rural areas, uh, 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 many many zoning ordinances uh, uh, touch uh, everyone. And, and in Michigan, even uh, up north, if uh, if a local government doesn't have zoning, the county, in many instances, will undertake the zoning. So uh, that, that's certainly uh, one of the things that makes it consequential as a regulatory program. Now, on the other hand, uh, from the outset, uh, back, going back to the 20s, uh, zoning laws have either been loved or hated. It, you know, it really depends on your philosophy, uh, especially at the beginning uh, when zoning just came along that really was intruding on people's lives to a great degree. Uh, in 1921, Baltimore lawyer and zoning Publicist Jefferson Grinalds touted that zoning is the greatest piece of constructive legislation ever passed. Uh, and then balancing that out, getting, getting your feet back on the, on the earth, uh, in 1925, Isaac Loeb Strauss, the former attorney general for the state of Maryland, characterized zoning as viciously illegal. So, and, and that was uh, all those years ago. It, uh, zoning has now endured 100 years. And um, uh, as I've noticed here, um, uh, there are good zoning ordinances and there are bad zoning ordinances. And uh, in my opinion, uh, having dealt with this subject and been to many, many, many uh, uh, local government meetings, and seeing many ordinances, writing a few. Uh, I believe that uh, whether an ordinance is good or bad really depends in great part on uh, the, the role played by the planning commission uh, 
uh, and the planning consultants, typically planning consultants, sometimes legal, sometimes engineering. But uh, it, it's wonderful to see uh, dedicated planning commissioners that uh, stay on the planning commission for many years, develop a, a, an incredible expertise, both in terms of the the character and details of the community, uh, as well as a concern for uh, the long term. On the other hand, uh, in, in uh, situations where zoning becomes a political tool, uh, where uh, people are, are taking advantage of, of political clout and so forth for their, for their own purposes rather than for uh, community interest at large, uh, and, and many times that's where things go off the tracks. So uh, looking at zoning and trying to evaluate whether it's good or bad or uh, is it productive or whatever, uh, it's 100 years old. So I think we, we need to really look at the history to, to be in a position to formulate uh, some understanding on that. Uh, so let's go back to the early parts of the story. In fact, let's like, uh, as, they, as they'd say uh, on the Lone Ranger, let's go back to yesteryear. Um, I don't have a, a horse that I can ride and all that, but uh, and probably most people don't know what the heck I'm talking about because it happened so long ago, Lone Ranger. Uh, but in any event, uh, zoning is really the child of uh, the Industrial Revolution. You know, that started in the in the 1800s and then went through uh, 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 early parts of the 1900s. In fact, uh, you know, just kept kept rolling along. Uh, but it was this revolution that brought to the cities this uh, substantial uh, movement and convergence of commerce, mechanization, and, and invention. And uh, as that occurred, uh, uh, more urbanization brought people closer together, brought impacts from what they were doing, uh, uh, that so that it touched their their neighbors to uh, a much greater degree, uh, and uh, and zoning was approved as a concept, as a as a legal concept in 1926. And I can tell you that um, if you study uh, constitutional law and uh, related uh, subjects there, you'll find that the U.S. Supreme Court was actively engaged in providing a support for the Industrial Revolution and helping the United States on the big picture, uh, on the world stage, uh, to become uh, 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 you know, a, 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 an entity that had uh, equal footing with all the, all the countries around the world. And, uh, and so uh, in many instances, uh, a business got got a, a very fair, uh, in fact, more than a fair share of uh, of good play. So, pre zoning before, so zoning. Let's say it started in uh, uh, 1916 to 1920, thereabouts. Uh, and if you set aside the subject of deed restrictions, the general rule that people lived with for many years. Uh, up to the time that zoning really got rolling was that a person could really use their property for uh, any purpose that was lawful, of course, but uh, they could use their property intensely uh, to the point, as long as they didn't uh, interfere uh, with the other, other property owners. So this was essentially the law of nuisance. And uh, uh, nuisance, uh, by definition, is a uh, an unreasonable and substantial invasion of another's interest in private uh, use and enjoyment of land. Um, and so when, uh, when one property owner uh, went a little too far, there could be a nuisance lawsuit filed. Uh, and, uh, and that was fine as long as it, there weren't that many nuisances that occurred. And, and it, you know, in the early days, there really weren't that many nuisances, so it wasn't a problem, but if you uh, 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 try to uh, look at these cases, 
uh, somebody is being subjected to a nuisance, they've got to file a lawsuit. The nuisance probably continues while the not lawsuit is, is, is going on. So somebody's suffering and then everybody's spending all this money. Um, uh, and, and eventually when we got into the 1900s, uh, again, bringing in the convergence of congestion of residents, uh, workers, motor vehicles, factories, shoppers, high-rise buildings uh, into our great cities. Uh, everybody's in close quarters, high-intensity conflict, nuisances galore, and uh, to so many that, uh, that it was kind of out of hand. So uh, planners really responded and and of course, uh, Jim Schaefer and Ryan Dividak, they love the idea that the, that the planners were the, the heroes. Uh, they're still heroes, of course. But um, so urban planners promoted this idea of city beautiful. Uh, and that concept arose in the Chicago Exposition in uh, 1893, it was like a World's Fair sort of thing, where they actually built a city uh, in the south part of Chicago, uh, right in the area where the University of Chicago is now. And for the first time, uh, many people realized how if you plan something out, it, it could be pretty strikingly uh, uh, functional. But, and, uh, and so that really took off, the planning took off. And now, uh, unlike zoning, planning is really not regulatory, so it didn't have uh, the teeth, but the idea of planning from the beginning was to divide the community, divide the city into several use districts and arrange these districts uh, in a way that they were separated uh, from inconsistent uses. Now, one of the key objectives was to make sure that residential neighborhoods uh, were separated from potentially harmful and unhealthy uh, uh, situations. And that so that was one of the original uh, key objectives to this. Now, as I mentioned, planning is not regulatory. And so if somebody's not following the planning, there's very little the local government could do about it, uh, at least, uh, you know, if push came to shove. And so planning was followed close, closely behind by zoning. And zoning is regulatory, which means that when you pass a zoning ordinance, there's an obligation to follow it. And if you don't follow it, there are uh, potential penalties uh, involved. And, uh, uh, but the original uh, zoning uh, was required to follow a plan, just like it is today zoning in accordance with a plan. And uh, roughly the time of that that uh, original Euclid versus Ambler lawsuit that approved the concept of zoning, <clears throat> the uh, federal government uh, produced and distributed a, uh, a little booklet with a standard zoning enabling act. And uh, there are various footnotes in that zoning enabling act, uh, standard act that, um, clarify the importance of zoning in accordance with a plan. And I'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, but so again, the, the concept was rather than waiting for a nuisance to occur, uh, you would adopt re zoning regulations based on planning, uh, which would essentially anticipate circumstances in which the public safety and health would be jeopardized. So. So you don't put uh, industrial factories next to a residence. That, I mean, that's basically the concept uh, because you can anticipate reasonably that when you do that, there may well be some conflict, uh, especially if there are, there's heavy machinery and anything dangerous outside, heavy trucks going in and out and all that. And so that kind of separation carried the day in uh, making life and uh, qual quality of life a little bit better. <clears throat> now, uh, over the years, <clears throat> uh, controversy has arisen. And uh, I don't think there's any doubt that one of the uh, controversies 
<clears throat> is created by uh, local governments imposing various kinds of regulations like minimum lot and house sizes uh, and prescribing other requirements that add large costs to, uh, to residences. And the ultimate impact of that was to restrict affordable housing in various communities. Uh, and uh, there's really a need for a mix of housing, uh, housing types, uh, including uh, single family homes, uh, apartments, condominiums, uh, and uh, mobile uh, mobile homes and all of those kinds of things that uh, that promote affordability. Uh, and I think there's a, there's a, a lot more uh, awareness of that today than than there was even in the 60s, 70s, and maybe even into the early 80s. Uh, and that doesn't mean that that uh, people don't say don't you know don't put that mobile home park in my backyard and don't put that apartment complex in my backyard. Uh, you know, that's been going on for a long time. And again, I think there's some uh, more awareness on that. So, so really affordability uh, was one of the major issues. But in addition to that, the impact on minorities uh, in uh, uh, major urban and suburban development occurred uh, during the period of separate but equal. Now, uh, if if you weren't on hand for the last session, session number three, uh, we discussed the idea of uh, the, the, the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, United States Supreme Court in 1896. And you can always go back and, and uh, look at that program uh, online uh, through Ogden County Planning and Economic Development. Uh, but Plessy versus Ferguson was the case that basically held that um, that you could separate uh, uses, separate uh, uh, authorizations of, of land use based on race uh, as long as the facilities and improvements and services were of an equal character. And believe it or not, that that concept went on through till 1954. So that's over over uh, almost 60 years. And uh, and that was upheld. Uh, and, and believe me, uh, looking at the background in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education, that case barely passed even in 1954. But the key here is that there was a very significant movement of people around the country uh, uh, during the period of separate but equal, and particularly during World War I and World War II, where you had uh, people from all over going into local uh, urban areas for jobs and to help the war effort and all that. Uh, but here they came into, into urban areas, but there's, there's separate but equal playing out along with other associated kinds of uh, discriminatory activities. And, uh, and so that's how uh, segregation got such a huge and strong uh, foothold. Okay, let's touch on modern zoning, uh, just to move this along. Uh, and my uh, assertion is that zoning remains very important uh, but has room for improvement. Now, why do I say it's it's so important? Uh, think about if we went back today to uh, a situation where you did not have zoning, a uh, zoning mechanism that separated high intensity industrial and so forth uh, from uh, uh, residential. It, it could be a problem. A and it isn't just a problem for residential. Uh, if you think about, I mean, let's just assume that you're in Chicago where they have the stockyards and they bring all the, the animals in for butchering and slaughtering and all that. I mean, let's say you put the stockyards right next to a fine dining restaurant or, you know, some high scale uh, retail. Uh, that's a problem for everybody. Uh, so it's not just residential. Uh, 
the separation of, of uses is, is important. Uh, now, does it have room for improvement? Absolutely. And uh, I think we, we really need to focus on the ways we can improve it rather than uh, throwing the uh, baby out with the bathwater. Uh, again, uh, uh, zoning needs to be done in accordance with the master plan. It's a key underpinning for due process. What do I mean by that? Uh, the idea is due process means that <clears throat> things have to be done for good reason. <clears throat> in other words, that, that the zoning has to be done on, on functional grounds. So if you just are zoning arbitrarily and say, okay, let's put uh, this here and put this over here and this over here. And, oh, my friend and cousin owns this property. So let's make that uh, a lucrative kind of thing. That's arbitrary and it's not in accordance with the plan. So you've got to do this in accordance with the plan and have functional uh, use districts to avoid arbitrariness. Uh, now zoning has, made some really interesting advancements that didn't exist uh, in the 1920s. <clears throat> and that would include things like the planned unit development and a special land use mechanism. So what is so special about them, in, unlike the um, uh, situation in the uh, earlier 1900s, even the mid 1900s, uh, with these mechanisms, uh, the uh, zoning ordinance can provide significant discretionary authority on, on approvals to land uses. On planned unit development, uh, you can put uh, a residential development, single family, along with some multifamily, along with a golf course, uh, and things like, and maybe even a little coffee shop or whatever, you can mix the uses uh, and still uh, uh, be considered to be lawful. Uh, yes, yes, it, it somewhat uh, deviates from the idea of separating land uses, but with the planned unit development, they are uh, placed in the same project uh, based upon planning. So it's like a mini separation of use districts with uh, with good reason uh, put into place. As similar with the special land use, you could have uh, more discretion by the planning commission or other approving body or person. And, uh, and with that, you can allow uses uh, if, if they're designed in a way to protect surrounding uses and whatnot, uh, even though they might not otherwise be uh, things that you could approve without uh, a good oversight. Uh, uh, next, under paragraph T, uh, the Planning Commission. Now, to me, uh, in my experience over the years, the Planning Commission is really the unsung hero of, uh, of zoning and the good things about zoning. As I say, you can have, you can have individuals that have uh, been on the Planning Commission for 20 or 30 years they know the community inside out and know uh, 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 what is if they have a really good uh, ethics and all that kind of thing. They can do so much good, uh, and uh, and the planning commission is uh, engaged in actually preparing the zoning ordinance in the first place and preparing amendments to the zoning ordinance to improve it. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, the Planning Commission uh, gets involved in uh, making discretionary decisions that uh, uh, can, can uh, offer flexibility and creativity and, and things of that nature. Uh, modern zoning also includes a continued uh, participation of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I like to think about this as like a pressure release valve. If you're zoning a whole community, uh, you can't possibly take into consideration each and every little piece of property, and there are going to be some quirks and uh, all of that kind of thing. So you're going to have the, the generally applicable uh, rules and regulations that, that occur community-wide. Uh, and then for unusual things, there's the Zoning Board of Appeals that can grant relief from the generally applicable rules 
so as to make uh, property more functional and uh, more usable, more reasonable. And the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, you know, also interpret the ordinance uh, when issues come up. And of course, uh, by uh, consistent with its name, the Zoning Board of Appeals can hear uh, appeals from decisions made by uh, administrative uh, uh, officials in the community. Exclusionary zoning. And ex exclusionary zoning gets back to what I was mentioning about where, where zoning got off the rails to some degree, uh, uh, making housing unaffordable to uh, large segments of society, maybe low income, maybe even low moderate income couldn't afford certain uh, uh, communities uh, for zoning for, as a result of the zoning. Uh, and um, and so uh, over the years and in, into the uh, early 70s, uh, decisions started being made in court that prohibited the exclusion of large segments of, of society uh, from local governments and, and uh, with a directive that uh, it was necessary to make provision for uh, uh, all kinds of people in the community, all kinds of uses. Uh, today, we have this function served in many states, including Michigan, uh, by um, by the zoning ordinance, it's, uh, the zoning ordinance itself, and, and the zoning enabling act itself. And so, you've got a provision in the zoning enabling act that basically says uh, that if you have a lawful use. Uh, that is excluded from the, from the, the local government as well as in the surrounding area so that it's not accessible, uh, the local government has to permit that use as long as there's some place in the community where it can be reasonably located. So that it can be a very powerful uh, a very powerful uh, tool in the toolbox if a local government is unreasonably uh, excluding. Challenges, uh, and I I'd like to mention this uh, because it's it's not as well understood as it could be. Uh, challenges can be of a, le a legislative challenge or a challenge of administrative action. And so, if the local government rezones property, rezoning is a legislative act. So it takes takes the action of the legislative body to create a zoning ordinance or to amend the zoning ordinance. Uh, now, if a, 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 a grieved party comes in to challenge zoning, in other words, challenge a legislative act, it's a much harder case to make. And the, the challenger has to show uh, either that there's a due process violation, that the that the local government is just acting arbitrarily in, when they when they zoned or refused to zone property and left left this property uh, in a in a bad situation, or that the zoning resulted in a loss of use of the property. In other words, a so-called taking without uh, uh, just compensation. So, in both those situations, that's that, they're tough cases to make. And rough, rightly so, because if the legislative body is zoning the whole community and it's an easy case to upset the apple cart, then, then it's going to throw the whole idea of, com of comprehensive planning out the window. And so it's a tough case. Now, administrative challenges are different, whereas the legislative challenges of the existing zoning, the administrative challenge has to do with challenging the refusal to grant the relief requested. So if I ask for a variance or I'm asking for a special land use, the, the aggrieved party is challenging the refusal to grant my relief. Uh, now, in the case of the Zoning Board of Appeals in Michigan, there's a specific statute that lays out the standards, but in other situations, the test is abuse of discretion, whether the local government has abused its discretion in denying the administrative relief. Now, is that an easy case to make? No, 
uh, but it is uh, probably more straightforward, number one, and number two, uh, more expeditious and uh, less costly uh, in terms of uh, litigation. So you've got those two things, legislative uh, and administrative, and that's an important thing and an important distinction to keep in mind. <clears throat> okay. Uh, if you have questions, jot them down because, uh, or send them right to uh, uh, Jim and Ryan now, and, and they'll be asking uh, questions later, asking your questions later. Zoning, uh, non-zoning land use controls. Uh, and this would be, uh, uh, these would be, this would be legislation again, generally speaking, established by regulatory ordinances as compared to a zoning ordinance. And the passage of a regulatory ordinance, generally speaking, is has much less formality. Uh, quite often, there's no need to have a public hearing before you put a regulatory ordinance into place. Uh, you don't have the planning commission uh, that has to conduct uh, uh, hearings or, or make a recommendation. Uh, you could have a legislative body go into session and uh, uh, pass, a, pass a regulatory ordinance. Uh, uh, as it as it deems fit, uh, of course, in some cases you need a first and second reading, but but that's a much easier thing than certainly than zoning. So regulatory ordinances, um, uh, and, I, and I'll talk about this in greater detail. But generally speaking, regulatory ordinances <clears throat> cannot serve the function that zoning serves uh, because if you allowed that, that's essentially a way to uh, sidestep the need to have public hearings, have planning commission recommendations and so forth. So you cannot try to accomplish zoning by regulatory ordinances. And uh, often a uh, regulatory might deal with, with uh, streets and other public property, but, there, but, but it also deals with private property, such as probably one of the most basic uh, exercises of, of uh, non-zoning uh, regulatory ordinance would be your construction code or codes. Uh, and uh, these would be your uniform codes uh, adopted uh, maybe on a, a national or international basis, like the International Building Code. Uh, and uh, local governments uh, don't go uh, into a session and debate what kind of wood should be used here? Or, uh, what are, what kind of construction uh, or uh, electrical things or fire codes? Uh, normally, what happens with these codes is that the local government will adopt a uniform code by reference. So the, the local government will say, "We're going to adopt the the uh, uh, 2018 uh, International Building Code." Uh, for this local government. Now, of course, uh, there are, are local governments all over the country. Uh, some have one kind of climate and some have a different kind of climate. So there are places in these codes where uh, local governments need to fill in the blanks, so to speak, and, uh, uh, and take into consideration natural variations that are anticipated. Now, when a local government wants to make a more basic change to the code, like a substantive provision uh, of, of the code that is going to change uh, the way homes are built, uh, maybe, for example, if you have a community that wants to get involved with um, exclusionary zoning and they want to require all expensive materials and so forth in a home, then you have to get state permission for this kind of change. Because this, that's one of the things that the state is overseeing is to make sure that you have uniform construction. Uh, and, and that would be to, to avoid problems that I was mentioning, but also to, to avoid uh, uh, local governments allowing uh, builders to cut corners, for example, which you know, generally doesn't happen in, in good communities and most communities. But uh, so the construction codes uh, are are you know something that nearly every community has, of course, and uh, and and they're adopted. Uh, they normally incorporate a uniform code to get that done. Uh, 
subdivision uh, regulations. Uh, and most people have heard of the Platt Act, uh, Subdivision Control Act, and as it is is morphed in Michigan, the Land Division Act. Uh, this is a, a state statute that contemplates local regulation as well. Uh, and uh, it uh, makes provision for the establishment of a multi-lot uh, uh, projects, typically residential, not always, but typically residential, uh, in order to, number one, create some uniformity of regulation, but number two, uh, it, it's a, a more uh, expeditious and uh, functional for local assessors to be able to refer to a piece of property as as lot one of so and so subdivision uh, and give that a a, a number a, a tax ID number lot one gets this number lot two gets that number uh, and uh, and of course there's some basic regulations that go along with subdivisions uh, uh, in uh, days of old uh, unscrupulous developers might might plant a subdivision with half the lots underwater and uh, sell them uh, sell them to uh, uh, people that uh, have purchased sight unseen. They go look at their property, it's all underwater uh, or the roads are all underwater. So, and so, so uh, these regulations were adopted to, to avoid a lot of those kinds of problems. Now, what has happened with subdivision regulations is that, that uh, uh, with state regulation as well as local regulation, uh, the locals have uh, put on again, <laughs> once again, so many regulations that uh, that it takes forever and a day to get a project through the subdivision uh, process. And so what happened is when condominium regulation was was uh, formalized to a greater degree and, and made a little more uniform, uh, you have state statute and local ordinances that allow condominium projects to be developed much more quickly. And uh, so, so what's the difference between subdivision regulations? Kind of any anyway, regulations are maybe more uh, as a more practical matter. What's the difference in the outcome? What's the difference in the product that comes out of these regulations? <clears throat> Whereas subdivision regulations, you essentially have a series of lots and a person is gonna buy a lot and then they're gonna build their home on that lot and they're gonna own the whole lot and own their home. They're gonna have their little uh, fiefdom uh, in that uh, location. You're probably gonna have deed restrictions that uh, uh, govern what can be done and can't be done uh, on that lot. And in the subdivision, maybe set out a, a plan for parks and all that. Uh, Whereas condominium regulations uh, are kind of a mystical sort of thing, that are quite a bit different. So with condominiums, you create the kind of these condominium documents that have a site plan like a plat map, uh, and you have bylaws that include things like deed restrictions, uh, and uh, but but you're not always the purchaser is not always buying what is the equivalent of a lot. Condominiums uh, are based on, on units. So the home is a unit. It's not, you're not buying the whole lot necessarily. You might be, but you're not, you're buying a home. What, so what's a unit? It's a unit is what is defined in the bylaws. So what could it be? What are the choices? And, and it's really open for flexibility. A unit might mean the inside walls of a residence and everything inside of that, not the outside walls, not the roof, none of the property around and so forth. So that could be a unit. Uh, possibly a unit is the inside walls, what's inside of that, plus the outside walls. Uh, and in that case, maybe the owner of the unit will be responsible for maintaining the roof and maintain painting and all that kind of thing. Uh, or maybe the maybe the condominium association will do that. 
some condominium units uh, include the the home itself plus a little plot of property around the unit and the property owner or the unit owner is responsible for maintaining all of that and yet then the rest of the yard might be called uh, a limited common area which i've got at the bottom of this slide and, and uh, so that might include driveways and uh, private yards but it's a limited common area, which would probably mean that the condominium association is gonna maintain that part that is a, a limited common uh, area or common element. And um, uh, and the homeowner will, will maintain what's inside of that. General common areas then uh, would be something that is probably accessible to everybody in the project and would include roads, for example, the obvious thing where people can use all the roads in the condominium development, maybe uh, easements that uh, that uh, where in, in which the water lines, sewer lines and other utilities are built, uh, sidewalks uh, and all that uh, might be general common elements. So uh, the end product is pretty similar or might be might be pretty similar than what you get in a subdivision. Uh, and eventually, uh, developers of condominiums decided that people actually like the subdivision arrangement where you have the whole lot and you put your house on there and you maintain everything. Uh, and so uh, uh, developers created the concept of site condominiums. Uh, and with a site condominium, the unit, is everything you'd buy with a subdivision lot, essentially. You'd buy the whole lot uh, and uh, and you'd build your home and, and maintain everything just like you would if you uh, bought in a subdivision. Well, okay. Uh, and, and if there are questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them. I about have to move along though to make sure that we get through this. Um, environmental regulation. They would be other regulations that would be adopted, generally speaking, um uh, by regulatory ordinances uh and uh, one of the basic regulations that that kind of overarches of uh, the regulatory program would be the natural resources environmental protection act often referred to as the nrepa uh, and um, there are numerous parts the original environmental protection act in michigan is now part 17 of the NREPA, which is MCL 324-1701. Uh, and, and it's actually a pretty powerful provision. Uh, the attorney general or any person may maintain an action in the circuit court having jurisdiction where the alleged violation occurred or is likely to occur for declaratory or equitable relief against any person for the protection of the air water and other natural resources and the public trust therein uh, and uh, and to protect it from pollution impairment and destruction so a very powerful provision uh, over the years the court has narrowed some of the scope of it so it doesn't allow somebody from uh, 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 taking another person to court that it doesn't involve a significant natural resource but this is like the basic unit of uh, environmental protection, it's a state law uh, and uh, local governments uh, 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 sometimes, uh, maybe in the 70s and 80s more often, but sometimes create their own uh, environmental protection provisions uh, uh, in something like wetlands and uh, woodlands and things of that nature. So as part of the NREPA, uh, there's a codification of other other things that had existed, and it was all codified as part of the uh, of this uh, omnibus uh, codification. Uh, so we have Part 213, and they're all they're all codified as parts. Uh, part 213, leaking underground storage tanks. Part 301, inland lakes and streams. All both of them, and, and the Part 303 wetlands. All three of them had been freestanding statutes on their own that were all then put into the NREPA. Uh, these are just examples. There are a lot more. Uh, 
uh, that deal with uh, various subjects. And then, of course, the Act also added a number of additional regulations for uh, uh, many things, uh, such as uh, uh, ferrous mining and uh, uh, things like that. Uh, and but and here's where sometimes there is a little uh, jockeying for local non-zoning regulations and state uh, non-zoning regulations. The question is who's got jurisdiction over what subject? Uh, and uh, obviously the legislature has the authority to preempt local governments from various kinds of things. And uh, uh, that fight is going on right now in the subject of gravel mining, where gravel mining is part of uh, most zoning ordinances that that where gravel is deposited naturally and this and uh gravel mining interests are trying to take that authority away from local governments and give it to eagle uh at the state level signs and billboards another important area of regulation uh you know just about every community that regulates by zoning uh, uh regulates signs and billboards uh townships often do it by by zoning, uh, uh, cities and villages often do it under under a sign regulation authority, which would be a regulatory ordinance. Uh, and one of the important things there is that under regulatory ordinances, you don't have the problem of uh, non-conforming uses. So you can change the rules to some degree. Uh, and uh, if, as long as you're acting fairly and reasonably, you might be able to avoid non-conforming uses. But signs and billboards are really a controversial area of regulation, primarily because signs and billboards get into the First Amendment. Now, a lot of it has to do with commercial uh, advertising and, and commercial advertising is not as protected. It is protected, it wasn't previously, but it is protected under the First Amendment. Uh, but it, um, as soon as you get into the First Amendment, uh, the courts are much um, more apt to be uh, uh, really jealously guarding and guarding the First Amendment rights. So we had a case in 2015, Reed versus Town of Gilbert, Arizona, and Gilbert just went crazy in terms of putting very close restrictions on local governments regulating signs and billboards uh, because the whole notion is as soon as a local government starts regulating the content of a sign or billboard, uh, now you're getting into closer, strict scrutiny. And this is a subject that we took up in session two uh, a, a, a while ago. And you can go back and review that to uh, get a better understanding of strict scrutiny. I hope you do if, you, if, uh, if it's something that you want to know more about. Uh, but strict scrutiny essentially puts a huge burden on the government to demonstrate this compelling need to regulate and couple that with the idea that the regulation has to be done by the least restrictive means. So if, you're, if it's got to be a compelling need for the regulation and be done in the least restrictive means, I can tell you right now that Look, the governments, state, and local governments, federal government, if it gets into that strict scrutiny, the government's probably going to lose and generally does lose. Uh, and so uh, that this the signs and billboard regulation, very big area. We could probably spend a whole hour on that or longer. Uh, most recent case on this subject was uh, the city of Austin versus uh, Reagan National Advertising. And uh, in that case, uh, some of the uh, lower courts had been making rulings, and when I say lower courts, lower federal courts, been making rulings that, that a local government couldn't distinguish in its ordinance between a sign for a particular property and a billboard that advertised uh, an interest located elsewhere. Uh, and they were the, these lower courts were striking these ordinances down left and right. Case went to the US Supreme Court about a year ago. And uh, in this case, uh, the court upheld local government's uh, right to make a distinction and regulate uh, off uh, 
uh, on versus off premises signs. Uh, examples of other types of um, regulatory ordinances, uh, and I've taken this list from uh, a statute called the Township Ordinance Act, but you can see a list that is very comparable, probably a little longer, uh, in what's known as the Home Rule Cities Act. And the Home Rule Cities Act is the act that uh, governs the creation of city and village charter. Well, this is the Home Rule Cities Act would be for the city charters, and there's a Home Rule Village Act. And, and those acts would say, okay, if you adopt a charter, uh, you must have these kinds of regulations, and you may have these kind of regulations. So very similar kind of thing. So the whole notion, and, and you can see in the first bullet point here, uh, a regulatory ordinance under, in the, under the Township Act, uh, it gives authority to regulate the public health, safety, and welfare of persons and property, including, but not limited to, ordinances concerning, and I've got the list below it, but you can see the public health, safety, and welfare, I mean, that's a, that is, kind of opens the, the whole world, you know, that's not, that's not restricted into one small oyster, I mean, that's a big thing that, uh, that is opened up there, so it, it uh, authorizes townships to do a lot of non-zoning regulation. But again, uh, some of the areas uh, expressly mentioned in the uh, Township Act would be uh, regulations for fire protection, uh, licensing uh, of the use of bicycles. Uh, traffic codes would be a, a something that townships can do, of course. Uh, and you'd have to look at another code, I think the Uniform Traffic Code, you'd look at that as well. Parking of vehicles, sidewalk maintenance and repairs, licensing of uh, business establishments, and uh, licensing and regulation of public amusements. These are just just a handful of things that are non-zoning, but essentially get into the regulation of, of land use. And again, one of the key things here: easier to adopt, and number two, uh, you don't have non-conforming uses but it, you cannot sidestep zoning by just saying, we're gonna pass a regulatory ordinance because if you do, you go to court, the court will say, oh, wait a minute, did you pass this under the zoning authority? No, we just passed it under a regulatory ordinance. Well, I'm sorry that it's invalid because if it's zoning, you've got to pass it under zoning authority. Uh, and just to be clear, uh, uh, this slide to varied application is, is permitted or authorized. So ordinances, can be enacted to apply to streets, roads, and highways or portions of the town. You don't have to adapt a regulation that is applicable township-wide. And this is true in cities as well, of course. Uh, and uh, the board might uh, restrict uh, regu certain regulations to specified planted lands within a township. Uh, and sometimes communities are hesitant to pass a regulation applicable only to one subdivision or another subdivision or a certain area, but uh, this ordinance act gives you that authority to do. Uh, and I think this is final, the final slide, and we're kind of on time to uh, save some time for questions. How do you enforce these ordinances, both the zoning and non-zoning? Uh, they can be enforced by criminal uh, uh, remedies. So this would be uh, by misdemeanor. Uh, if you uh, violate the ordinance, you, you could go to uh, jail for 90 days uh, or pay a fine or both. Uh, the uh, shortcoming with doing that, obviously there's a, there is a great deal of clout with uh, being able to say you're gonna go to jail maybe if you violate this ordinance. On the other hand, if you have a criminal code, that means that the defendant can request a jury. And uh, uh, all, all of those kinds of uh, safeguards that go along with criminal prosecution would apply to the local government enforcing their ordinance by misdemeanor. The more common uh, methodology would be civil enforcement by civil infraction. So instead of issuing a misdemeanor ticket, you uh, issue a civil infraction ticket. Uh, and uh, in those cases, uh, the laws do not require trial by jury uh, and, uh, and the uh, 
initiation of a case is much easier. The prosecution of the case is much easier. Uh, and uh, and at the end of the case, if there is somebody found responsible for a violation, they'll pay a fine. Uh, and uh, the fine can be stated in the ordinance. In some cases, it's variable depending upon what the judge wants to do. Now, another way, especially for the enforcement of serious infractions, would be to go to circuit court. Now, when you go to circuit court, you're looking for an action for an injunction or other equitable relief. You might say, we judge, we want you to enter an order essentially stopping this activity from occurring. Uh, or if it's going to occur, it has to occur only in this area or uh, things of that nature. And now uh, the difference between the uh, misdemeanor and civil infraction and circuit court cases, is the misdemeanor and civil infraction, it would be in the district court, more accessible, less uh, costly, go to circuit court, bankruptcy. Uh, it is very expensive and the judges today put you through quite a bit of uh, uh, efforts to go to facilitation. In other words, you have your case, have a mediator appointed to do to look at it. You have all this discovery that occurs and you know the, the price tag just keeps going up. It's like the cash register keeps ringing uh, uh, for the, the parties that are in the case. Uh, which generally encourages settlement, rightfully or wrongfully. So that is uh, uh, my uh, my presentation today on uh, a zoning and non-zoning uh, authority by of uh, local governments and the uh, 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 administration of of all that by by the officials uh, in uh, in the local government. Happy to answer questions. And uh, uh, Jim, I see you are have your smiling face on there. <laughs> and uh, look forward to questions. Okay, Jerry, sure. you want to advance the slides so they get your contact information there. Um, and then uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, as part of conditional zoning application, can a petitioner offer and a local government accept conditions of a development they do not fully comply with underlying zoning district standards? such as greater density, lesser setbacks, or fewer parking spaces, similar to what is allowed for a PUD? Good question. Yeah, um, uh, there is a provision now in the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act. Uh, in my opinion, it's not that well drafted uh, and requires an ordinance to ad administer it, to make sure that, that uh, uh, everybody is protected, both the property owner and the local government. But that statute allows the property owner to make an offer of a use uh, conditioned upon compliance with all the conditions that the property owner puts in the offer. Now, technically, it's not something that can be negotiated between the property owner uh, uh, and the local government, the local government has to say yes or no. Uh, but as a practical matter, um, uh, local governments often ask the property owner if they'd like to negotiate. You know, they've got a lot of clout, like we're gonna say no unless you negotiate. So uh, why don't we talk about this? Uh, and so the question becomes to what extent uh, can, the, can deviations be made uh, with the, the land use that is otherwise required. Uh, I don't believe that um, you could put a commercial use in a residential zone, for example. Um, uh, and and uh, to some degree, it's, it's going to be necessary to look at the master plan to see, you know, what is, what is the intent of this district, and then look at your intent provisions in the zoning ordinance. But uh, you can uh, make provision for higher density, I believe, and smaller setbacks and uh, things of that nature, uh, and uh, and then the local government should record something uh, and have that provision in their ordinance so that it's recorded and everybody's on notice what has been approved uh, so that uh, if, if somebody buys property adjacent, they'll know what they're getting into, and if somebody buys that property from the original developer, they'll know what their, uh, their rights and obligations are. Okay, great. Um... The second question here is, I understand it, no community in the county has considered 
or had discussions regarding abolishing single family only zoning as has been achieved in Minneapolis and other communities on the coast. Uh, what are the most realistic opportunities for progressive zoning changes in the country? Uh, and then a, a follow up in particular, is there any discussion about implementing elements of the Michigan Association of Planning zoning reform toolkit in Oakland County? Ah, I'm I'm not as familiar as I could be, I suppose, with the with the map uh, toolkit. But uh, so the question is, can you can you uh, require an expansion beyond just single family? Is that that? No, the the question is, uh, some communities uh, elsewhere in the country have actually abolished single family only zoning. They've, ah. elim they've eliminated it, and the question is, um, what are the most realistic opportunities? Uh, for those types of progressive zoning changes in okay. county. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, going back, uh, there was there was a case. I think it was in the fifties or sixties, even in Bingham Farms, where the whole the whole uh, village was zoned for single family residential and no other use. And and the court held that um, that that kind of zoning is not what is contemplated in the Zoning Enabling Act. So then the next step is. Okay, so you can't just have single family, you've got to have other districts. But I, as I'm getting this question is, can you in substantially all districts require zoning that permits more than just single family? And, and I would say the answer to that is yes, that, that would be certainly permissible under the current statute. Um, and what would be required for that I, I think three things would have to be considered. Number one, what does the master plan say? Because you, you should be zoning in accordance with the master plan. So you should amend the master plan to do it. Number two, you put, should put the express provision. What are the principal permitted uses in zone A? And if those principal permitted uses are single family plus uh, attached housing of some sort, or even multi-housing, you know, then then the local, that's the choice that the local government makes. Uh, and I said I there are three there were three things that I think should be considered. The other very important factor there is to look when to, when the zoning ordinance was initially established, um, the uh, uh, engineers that established established water lines, sewer lines, and things of that nature make those lines of a size based upon the zoning so with the expectation that a certain number of people are going to be served so if you willy-nilly and i mean that's a bad uh, situation you know you know if you really even carefully study this situation and say you know we want to have single family and attached housing with up to four units attached or whatever it is uh in in this zone you really need to take a look and see what the impact of that is on your on your sewer system, if there is a sewer system, uh, and uh, and the water system, because uh, you know if you overcharge the sewer water system, you may have to redo a whole line. That is not inexpensive. That's a big thing, uh, and so you have to to look at that. And then of course, uh, you know there are other services that that might be uh, uh, that come involved. But in my opinion, the answer is yes, you can do it. Uh, uh, and it's just a matter of uh, carefully planning and zoning uh, for it and watching out for any uh, uh, unint unintended consequences with, you, with your utilities. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. With that, we are uh, past our time limit. So I'd like to thank you very much for uh, being a speaker today. It was an excellent presentation. And thank you for everyone uh, for joining us. Thank and you so much. Be... I really... Appreciate everybody showing up, uh, both people, and uh, just kidding. Uh, and uh, uh, look forward to the next session. All right, and the uh, the uh, this recording will be available. Um, I posted the link in the chat. All right, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. In July. <laughs>